as you've made it to the final lecture um, that I will give before our final paper is due. So this is a fun one. This is the geography of language looking at the linguistic landscape. So this uh, lecture goes over um, all of the concepts that we've talked about so far as far as, you know, how does language relate to identity, our identity? You know, what is the, what are the ways in which we see that represented in our region or by, um, you know, our race, or ethnicity, our gender, our age, you know, what are some taboo languages? Um, what are some ways in which language is represented um, in the media? You know, what are some ways in which English is represented as a global language and how that might not uh, lead to language endangerment? You know, or what are some ways in which you see politics and language um, working together or working, up, working apart? So when we talk about geography of language, we're looking at um, the ways in which language is part of culture uh, and making sense of our place and our space. So the ways in which we make sense of that is by naming some of the places and the spaces that we, that we live in and that we observe. This idea of a linguistic landscape um, was really developed by Landry and Borges in Canada. And the idea is we want to give a visibility to the languages on objects that mark the public space in a given territory. So um, I have an assignment for you um, in the discussion questions, but just take a look around, um, around where you live and around, you know, um, your commute, whether that is to school, whether that is to work, and notice the types of languages that are being used. So when we look at linguistic landscapes, we're approaching an understanding of language as part of the physical environment. So what linguists would actually do is that they'll go out or their assistants would go out and they would physically count the number of signs that they see. And they would um, see, especially if it's a multi, um, multicultural community, what types of languages are represented. So in studying linguistic landscapes, we can, um, you know, examine graffiti, we can look at airports, tourist scenes, ethnic neighborhoods, um, so many other things that really index, um, you know, a little bit about our community, um, the people that live in our community, and what our social values are. So people who interact with the linguistic landscape, and we call them the cityscape. So this is all the languages that surround us, they direct us, they hail us, they call for our attention, and they flash their messages to us. So, you know, this is, um, you know, how do advertisers use language and what are the signs they use to attract us? And understanding the linguistic landscape can help us really understand the layers of a city, um, but also I think the um, the layers of the culture and the and the heritage and the society in which uh, this linguistic landscape is held. So, recap on semiotics, right? I've talked about semiotics since day one, but you know, Saussure, Ferdinand de Saussure, he really looked at the sign, the study of signs and their interpretation. So by sign, he meant like any kind of sign. It didn't have to be like a stop sign. It could be anything. It could be words. It could be logos. It could be a traffic sign, right? Um, and looking at, you know, what is it? What do they um, connote? What do they denote? What is, what is their message they're trying to send across? So there really is a relationship between the social and historical meanings and um the signs themselves, right? So the signs can mean different things to people and it can also represent the city or tell us what's going on with the city. And so in order to use this, I want you to think about the types of signs that you see in your everyday life and how that indexes uh, where you live as far as geography goes. So you know, geosemiotics could be the study of a social meaning of signs in space, not the space as an outer space, but in the space it takes up. So the sign only has meaning because of where it is in the world, right? So we're pinpointing uh, the use of a sign depending on um, where we are. These signs also help us to determine, you know, okay, you're here. They signal to you that you've arrived, right? So when you drive into Maryland from another state, it says Maryland welcomes you, you know, enjoy your visit. Um, recently I've seen the sign that says Maryland open for business, you know, so what does that mean? How do, um, these different states, um, mark their borders, uh, or welcome people or don't welcome people, right? 
So how do you know that you're in Baltimore? Some of you are driving in from Baltimore on 95, and so you'll see this smokestack here on the left, right? Uh, and so that, you know, is a sure sign that, okay, you've reached the city. Uh, whereas, you know, some of you probably see this marker on 295. Um, this sign also said, you know, marks that you're in the city. And so, um, you know, this these signs represent um, kind of a geographic positioning of this is this is where you are. Very interesting that they decided to choose orange, right, for their sign. Um, probably because, you know, or the orange for the Orioles, right? Um, some of you who've been in Baltimore, you've seen this sign, right? So when I first moved to Maryland, I saw this sign in Baltimore and I was like, why do they have a guy with one eye, right? And I didn't understand that it was supposed to be for Natty Bo. And so if you're from Baltimore, you understand that Natty Bo is not only, um, you know, a drink, but it's a symbol for, you know, the history of Baltimore the working class people, the, um, you know, the people who, uh, you know, make Baltimore who, the, who, what kind of city it is, right? If you, uh, have been to the Inner Harbor, you know, Domino's Sugars. Um, and so this sign also, you know, displays, you know, this is part of the history, the heritage. This is why a lot of people move to Baltimore. This is why it's become, you know, kind of a port city, right? Um, because a lot of business was conducted here. A lot of you also um, have witnessed the Orioles, right? The Baltimore Orioles. And so seeing the Orioles is a sign that you're, you're in Baltimore. Um, I've also seen this entering the Chesapeake Bay watershed, right? So, uh, you know, what are the, um, what are, what is the signify? What is the sign here? What is the meaning? Why would they decide to choose a crab, right? As one of their, um, as one of their symbols or fish or, um, you know, this kind of bird. Baltimore, Maryland, you know, um, how do you know you're in Maryland? Because of the Maryland flag. Okay, so what does the Maryland flag represent? And why are people, you know, um, I don't want to say obsessed, but why are people, you know, so, you know, invested in this flag, right? So what is the history behind that? And, you know, what kind of pride do they have behind this sign? Some of you, um, as soon as you, uh, you know, come onto UMBC campus, you, you know that you're in Baltimore just because, you know, we see the UMBC letters or you see the retriever or you see, you know, University of Maryland, right? Um, and that is an indication that you're in Baltimore. So what are some other signs that you see? A lot of you are, you know, from outside Maryland, so maybe you can give me some sort of testimony as to, um, you know, what did you first think of when you when you came into Maryland and you saw all these signs? You know, what do they represent? Looking here at you know Catonsville and and Ellicott City, clearly they they represent some sort of you know settlement patterns or you know um, they really value nature or they really value their history. So these would be um, part of the community and part of the the societal uh, culture that they want to represent. So when we talk about uh, geosemiotics, we also say that they're didactic markers. So that just means that they're closely related to the space that they are in. All the signs and symbols take up major part of their meaning from how and where they are placed. So are they on a street corner? Are they, you know, um, on some sort of you know, ledge? Are they a marker on the side of the road? Are they on, on a power plant, right? Uh, and it also indexes the time and history of the world. So, you know, um, if they, if they use a, a certain, like, since, you know, I think Ellicott City was, like, since 1700s, right? So what are they trying to say? Like, you know, how does that history become part of the culture? Each of them indexes a larger discourse of, um, you know, whether they're talking about public transportation or underground drug trafficking. Um, and so your textbook kind of gives you uh, an overview of the kinds of signs that you see, regulatory discourse, so this could be traffic signs, infrastructure discourse, so this could be street signs or signs responsible for maintenance, um, commercial discourse, advertising, right, they're trying to sell something to you, or transgressive discourses. So, you know, not only looking at the signs, but the kinds of um, signs which violate convention, right? Why are they violating convention? Uh 
These might be graffiti tags. This might be litter, right? So this is, um, you know, I, I explore, you know, explore the signs around you and see the ways in which they conform to conventions, right? Does Maryland seem like every other state uh, or is it a little bit different? So what are some transgressive discourses that you see? And so talking about the commercial discourses, this is, you know, you've already um, understand that, uh, you know, there's lots of different logos, right? So you have the UPS store or Crocs or Walmart or Save a Lot or Toy, RIP Toys R Us. But, um, you know, based on these symbols, uh, the commercial entities are able to brand them. So you understand, um, you know, what this place is. Uh, even before you, you know, go there because you understand the sign, right? So if you see a sign, you're able to understand, okay, Save a Lot is a grocery store. UPS store, I need to mail things. Crocs, I need comfortable shoes. You know, Walmart, I need to pick something up, right, for really cheap. So um, think about the ways in which companies will um, use particular signs to kind of, uh, you know, spread the word of their, of, uh, their storefront or property. Um, this is a scene from Hong Kong in the late, uh, sorry, in the 80s. So neon was very, very big. They called Hong Kong, um, you know, Vegas of the East back then. But look at the number of signs, right? There's so many, um, you know, it can kind of get blurring after a while. But this was kind of part of the historical culture of Hong Kong during the time. And so, you know, very different from the ways in which you see uh, Crocs and Walmart. So regulatory signs, as I mentioned, are the signs that um, are bound by social con uh, social construct, but also um, by these uh, regulatory committees, such as the government or uh, you know certain um, jurisdictions. So they'll set the signs to tell you or to warn you uh, to behave in a certain way. So employees only do not enter stop sign, a speed limit sign, right? You might see a sign in a neighborhood that says, you know, a dog, keep out or something like that. So these are tried to prevent you from doing something, trying to regulate your behavior. There are ways in which, of course, these regulatory signs can then become transgressive, right? So um, if you put something on a stop sign, it says stop hating, uh, right? And so this is this is a way for you to spread a different kind of meaning, do you notice the ways in which a stop sign versus these signs, you know, have? So they, they kind of want to portray a different message um, than just regulating discourse. And so, you know, it could, be, it could become transgressive in that way. And, of course, transgressive just means disrupting the ideology. We have signs for infrastructure, right? Like, how do you know, um, you know, that there that you should get off the highway if you want to go somewhere, right? So you, you we have signs for exits. We have signs for, um, you know, uh, the pole numbers, the light numbers, and so these are these are the signs that keep um, keep society society running. And so you know, these um, signs are only maybe applicable if you are an engineer or if you work with, you know, electricity, then you're able to understand these signs. Um, as a layperson, you probably wouldn't be able to understand. Um, driving, you have to be taught how to drive, you know, um, according to the different traffic signs. Um, and so that's why that's on your driving, te driving test, right? So you should be able to um, understand what the sign is, regardless of uh, the language. Um, and it could also be, you know, regulatory. So, so you have, um, you know, a, a, a infrastructure sign such as, uh, you know, something that marks a school district, right? But then the regulation is that it should only be 25 miles an hour. Um, and, you know, something you're coming off at the exit, right? And so, you know, there might be a speed limit that says, okay, everybody, you know, people might slow down so uh, you don't miss the exit. There are ways in which, uh, you know, signs can be transgressive, like I said. So, you know, they're playing with convention and they're actively disrupting the convention. So, you know, this on this picture on the left, it really looks like a crossing sign, right? It looks very much like a crossing sign, but, you know, press a button before you cross. But if you look a little bit closer, you'll see that it's a very different. So you'll see total crisis panic button, start running, 
you know, danger is imminent, don't think. Flashing lights and then stop means obey orders, right? Stay fearful and alert. So this is trying to play on the kinds of um, signs that you'll see at a stop, um, a stoplight or, you know, when you're about to cross the street. And so, you know, the signs are so similar that if you didn't read the uh, text, you wouldn't understand what was going on. Same thing for the um, the right picture, the picture on the right where it says press button, receive bacon, uh, enjoy bacon. Okay, so obviously you probably have seen this sign for, um, you know, I, I think for heating something or, or like uh, drying your hand. It's an air dryer, right? Um, but someone disrupted the sign and said, hey, those squiggly lines that are supposed to be air coming out, that looks a lot like bacon. So I'm going to say enjoy bacon. And it's supposed to be for, you know, a comedic effect. So when you tr when you transgress these kinds of conventions, you're kind of making a statement, you're trying to be funny, you're trying to, um, you know, portray a certain, certain point of view or, or send your message across. So linguistic landscapes um, and looking at transgressive signs, sometimes they can be top down, sometimes they can be bottom up. So for example, um, you know, this on the picture on the left, it's um, a sign from obviously the government um, set up the sign. They said no drinking alcohol, no drug dealers, right? No using drugs, no sleeping, uh, no bodily functions. Uh, very interesting, right? Bodily functions. Remember euphemisms from from the presentations past, right? So why would they use that, right? Um, so this is from the government. But if you look in the sign on the right, this is from the community itself. They said no drug selling in this neighborhood or we will call 911, right? So um, that is made from, you know, it's more bottom up. It's more grassroots. It's more... Um, a, a sort of public policing from the community perspective so the signs can really demonstrate you know who is of authority who's in charge how do they contain the power how do they police um, what they're trying to portray on the sign so you know we have top-down institutions and bottom-up institutions and it really is um, you know more of a continuum right so top-down you'll have these public institutions signs uh, general interest, public announcements, signs of street names. These are, you know, in order to get these signs changed, you have to go through a legal formal process. Whereas bottom up signs are signs that really that are from the community, right? So you'll have um, shop signs, clothing signs, private announcements, right? Um, private businesses, private want ads, right? So these, these are more um, of a private uh, sign. So Again, when you're looking at your neighborhood, consider, are they top-down? Are they government institutions, public institutions, religious, municipal, educational, medical, right? Are they more for a public standpoint or are they more of a, a private standpoint, right? And that would also determine, you know, the types of languages that they use because, you know, um, for example, if you're not from Baltimore and you see an, uh, a picture of the Orioles, you know, you're not really sure what's going on because that's more of a bottom up sign versus a top down sign. And so, you know, some of the bottom up signs could be graffiti. It could be, um, you know, think about like a, a, a board, like a message board. Like when you go to um, a Starbucks or a coffee shop and you see like different you know, like, oh, you dog training, and oh, I want to take jiu-jitsu, or I teach judo, or whatever. So these are signs from the community that are really bottom-up. So think about also the languages that are represented, you know, are they, do they represent a monopolistic landscape in that they're only using one language, one language is um, to rule them all, or are they bilingual, or are they trilingual, you know, the local languages can vary from official policies. Are they, you know, trying to enact some of the English only laws in their state? Or are they, you know, from the community, they're, they're presenting things in a certain language. So other languages might dominate the neighborhood level as reflected in the landscape, right? So over here on the right photo, you see a picture of, um, you know, a, uh, Poland, little Poland, Polski, right? And, you know, you can see that it's in America because it has an American flag, but it also has a Polish flag. Um, so it has things in English, but it also has things in Polish. 
So the importance of these these languages in tandem signals that the you know which languages are prominent, which are valued in society, which are valued in public spaces, which are valued in private spaces, and it also indexes social positioning of people who identify with with either languages. So for the fact that you know these um, you know Polish individuals are able to kind of enact this uh, this. Polish sign means that the Polish community is something that's revered, right? They really love the Polish community. Otherwise, they would, you know, not have a sign or, or they would be in hiding. So it really, you know, reveals their culture, their politics, their history. You know, maybe, you know, I know that um, Baltimore has a long Polish um, history, right? So what are some Polish signs that you see? Do you see any Polish churches? Do you see uh, Polish food restaurants, pierogies, you know? It's just a way in which people mark their territory. Um, and it also could be a way to include people. So if you're Polish-American, you'd really, you know, maybe resonate with these kinds of signs. Um, or, you know, it could exclude people. So, for example, um, you know, you might not feel very welcome if you're not Polish. So, you know, like I said earlier, linguists, they use these, um, you know, these uh, signs um to index different meanings in different neighborhoods. So this is from a study in which they looked at uh, three different types of Israeli neighborhoods, and they were able to um, index, you know, okay, so what are the signs and what are the languages being being used in the sign, right? So in the neighborhood, they saw a Jewish neighborhood, an Israeli-Palestinian neighborhood, and a non-Israeli-Palestinian neighborhood. So they said that the in Hebrew, Hebrew or Hebrew English um, had a very large percentage of the number of signs that they saw. Um, whereas, you know, in Israeli Palestinian, uh, you really saw uh, less Hebrew, um, a, less Hebrew than the Jewish neighborhoods, I should say, uh, and more of the Hebrew Arabic, um, you know, translations, right? But you still had a little bit of Arabic English a little bit of Hebrew Arabic English, a little bit of Arabic only, right? Very small percentage, um, and some Hebrew English. But then if you look at the non-Israeli Palestinian, you'll see that there's no Hebrew, right? So what is this, what is this, um, what are you trying to index here? What are you trying to mean? What, you know, there's no Hebrew, there's no Hebrew English. There's only Arabic only, Hebrew to Arabic, Arabic uh, to English or Hebrew, Arabic, English. So, you know, taking a look at the signs really, um, really uh, gives you an indication of how they are able to uh, think about um, and examine the culture in in these different neighborhoods. So, you can also look at this in global situations, you know, and write that in your discussion board. But, you know, on the left, you'll see a monolingual streetscape in Seoul. And then on the right, you'll see four languages, right? And this is four languages being used in Singapore. And so, um, you know, from the left, it's it's more of a, you know, um, commercial type usage to bottom up, right? But then on the right, it's more of a top down. So, you know, this represents the fact that in Seoul, in Korea, you know, most people speak Korean, they learn Korean, so you'll notice most of the text is in Korean, right? But in Singapore, there's four official languages, right? So, um, you know, you'll have Malay, you'll have Mandarin, you'll have Tamil, you'll have English, right? And all you'll see all four represented in the sign. So there's really three trends in the geography of language you'll notice it's an emergence of distinct linguistic geographies, right? So, you know, what is it about Maryland? What is it about Baltimore? What are some of these linguistic landscapes and what do they say about the people? You also notice the interaction and sometimes replacement of local varieties because of population movement, social change, operation and political power, right? So, um, you know, in the Hebrew um, Israel, um, Hebrew Arabic in the in uh, usage in the in the Israeli neighborhoods, right? What did they mean? You know, why would they use the sign, and and how does this um, is how does this impact with you know English, right? Uh, as a as a global language, and so um, you know, really reflects their beliefs, uh, and you know, the globalization of certain languages. So how 
um, prevalent do you see English in a lot of these different places? So what do you think of these signs? Foot Locker, The Home Depot, Old Navy, Sunglass Hut, Banana Republic. How do they um, kind of, you know, trademark their font or color to kind of grab at people's attention, right? Um, and looking at these signs, where would you think this is? A lot of you probably would say, oh, yeah, that's, you know, kind of similar to the image you showed before about Korea. But actually, this is in the United States. It's in Flushing. It's in Queens. It's in New York. And so back in 2007, uh, there's a writer from the in New York Daily News, and, uh, you know, they were very upset, right? So they said, um, you know, after dinner, a friend and I strolled up 37th Avenue. As we peeked into store windows, I realized that I could not identify any of the businesses travel agent, real estate, dentist, card store. One shop seemed to sell housewares, but every sign in the window was written in Korean. Or was it Chinese? So very interesting, right? This person is uh, very upset that the, um, that, you know, they're walking in New York City, which is in America, right? But they're able to see mostly Korean signs and, and this person's upset that, you know, the signs aren't really making them feel welcome. So what do you think about these linguistic landscapes, right? So on the left, you'll see, um, you know, uh, lots of Chinese and lots of um, English. It's in Philadelphia. And does anyone guess what, um, where this sign is? It is in Ellicott City. Okay, so not far away from UMBC. But it's dedicated as Korean Way um, in homage to um, the First uh, Lady of Maryland. Uh, so, you know... And it's also a um, homage to, you know, Ellicott City as kind of a Korean uh, Korean population, Korean culture, right? So what does that say about the community and its values, right? Um, why would why would they have this in, in Maryland, uh, maybe not somewhere else in the country? So talking about transgressive signs, right? Transgressive signs deliberately deviate from the commonly accepted institutionalized systems for a special effect. So the use of different languages disrupts and transverses uh, the language boundaries, right? Um, transgressive science is, is always bottom up, you know, uh, graffiti. Graffiti is a way to disempower people by making a visible mark to disrupt the landscape that's increasingly occupied by, um, you know, powerful people. So if that's the case, you know, is this sign transgressive? So this is a, um, the first sign is from PETA, uh, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, and they had a picture of a crab, um, and they said, it's me, not meat. See the individual, go vegan. Um, and so then Marilyn came out with a sign that said, okay, now I'm meat. See the individual, put Old Bay on it. And so this was kind of um, a funny, depending on, you know, whether or not you're vegan or not, um, retort towards, um, you know, this, this billboard, but you know, would this be considered transgressive? It does kind of, you know, disrupt the norms, the cultural norms, right? Um, but it's not bottom up, right? It's by Maryland, um, state of Maryland. So, uh, very top down. So could be argued one way or another. And, of course, I'm looking in the online landscapes, right? What are some, um, you know, ways in which, uh, you know, internet users, most of them come from Asia. But if you see the language being used for website content, most of the website content is in English, right? Or, you know, um, English, I think, encompasses more than all the other languages combined, right? The English language is, uh, or sorry, the online content is so inundated with English language articles and so we've talked about that before but you know just looking around you um you know it'd be very interesting if you went onto a website uh that was in Korean and you said okay but you know how am I supposed to navigate this website or something you know I'm sure the last writer of the New York Daily article would probably agree but you know this is uh for your group discussion or not group discussion for your discussion board what kind of um, languages and dialects do you see in your linguistic landscapes? What do they reflect about the people and community in which you live? What kind of language can you see in Baltimore or Maryland? How has linguistic landscape changed over your lifetime? How do you expect it will continue to change? 
Where have you noticed a different linguistic landscape? How was it different? How did you like it or not like it? And how would you feel if you saw a sign or signs that were not in a language you uh, understood? What would you do? Okay, so you could choose to agree or disagree with the writer. Um, so you can post it on the discussion board. And also, don't forget, for your final paper, please send me your final paper topic via email. Follow the guidelines on the syllabus. Um, all right, and I will see you on the discussion board.